Welcome to National Parks Presents. This is one of my favorite series that we do. Don't tell the other programs I run, <laughs> but it truly is one of my favorites. It's amazing. And it is an online series that we now run every other Tuesday. We started in January and this is going to go all the way um, until April 26th. That is the last Tuesday of the season. Um, this series covers a crazy amount of topics, um, and this one is going to be about the Women's Tea Party of 1873, because guess what? It is March 1st and the beginning of Women's History Month. Woo! We love Women's History Month. It's amazing. We love all months, but Women's History Month. Big fan, clearly. Um, before we get into that, though, I do want to go over some Zoom features. We are recording. <laughs> really enjoy that I love to sing and dance and I know we're recording every time. Um, you can find this one or other previous lectures that we have done in this series on the BPL YouTube page. The best way to find it honestly is to Google Boston Public Library YouTube and it will show up right there. I believe we are the second playlist um, on that site. If you are someone who does not enjoy the captions because we have enabled them, you can click the bottom row and turn those off. It will say, hide subtitles and you can turn them off on your screen. Um, and we really enjoy questions, okay? Don't be shy. We just ask you to be respectful. So everyone who has a question um, or if you wanna make a comment or if you wanna answer a question that is asked in the presentation, you can click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen, um, but be careful who you're sending it to. You can note, send it just to us. It will say to panelists and hosts, meaning the people you see on the screen, or you can send it to everyone, which is the people you don't see on the screen. So everyone at home just listening. Um, so you can always change that anytime as you're typing in your questions. Uh, Ranger Katie Woods is going to be going through the chat and holding on to your questions. And at the end, she will pop back um, and ask them to uh, Ranger Amelia after a presentation. Um, but once again, don't be shy. Question away. I love it. Um, so I just want to check, oh, before you leave as well, um, if you could fill out the survey, you guys are killing it with the survey filling out it. That, that's a sentence now, survey filling outing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's a good, good one, um, but you guys have been doing great and I really appreciate it. Um, and that's it on my end. So without, my, without any more nonsense from me, let's welcome Ranger Amelia as she presents Taxation Without Representation is Tyranny, the Women's Tea Party of 1873. Woo! All right. Thank you so much, Karen, for such a warm welcome. Um, my name is Amelia Benstead. I'm a ranger with the National Parks of Boston. Um, I'm going to get us right into it here. Um, so I wanted to start us off with a really easy question. Has anyone here ever visited a national park? And I want to encourage you just to drop your answers in the chat. Um, I see we have someone from Cambridge, so I'm going to guess they might have visited our national park. All right, I'm seeing a couple of yeses. Feel free to drop which park you visited too. Lots of enthusiastic yeses, Acadia, Lowell Stone, Yellow, Lowell, Yellowstone, Grand Teton. Awesome. So it looks like this is a well-traveled group. Um, the mission of the National Park Service is to preserve and protect natural, cultural, and historical resources um, for current and future generations. So here in Boston, we actually have three national parks, which often surprises folks. Um, so if you look at this map over here, we have the Boston Harbor Islands, which are located out in Boston Harbor. There's 34 islands and peninsulas. Um, we have Boston African American National Historic Site, which is located over on Beacon Hill. And then of course we have Boston National Historical Park, which is located in downtown Boston in the Charlestown Navy Yard. Um, and that really encompasses a lot of the Freedom Trail. So these three parks are collectively known as the National Parks of Boston and we are united under one superintendent, which makes it a lot easier for us to share resources, funding, um, employees across those three parks to really maximize the imp impact um, we can have in Boston for our visitors. Um, so 
Tonight, we're going to be talking really specifically about a piece of Boston National Historical Park. We're going to be talking about an event that was held at Faneuil Hall, which is that building you see on the left. Um, we're going to kind of dive into the Women's Tea Party, um, what exactly that was, who some of the major organizers of it were, the impact of that event, um, and really look at what it meant to the suffrage movement as a whole, not just in Boston, but on a national level. So to get us really in the right mindset for this, um, I wanna pose a question. And that is, what is the duty of a citizen when facing injustice? Um, so I wanna pause here and encourage everyone to just take a minute to really think about this. And if anybody feels ready to share their answer in the chat, I would love for you to put your answer in there um, so that we can kind of, as a group, get ourselves thinking about this question. So again, that is, what is the duty of a citizen when facing injustice? And we're going to take one minute just to think about it and put your answers in the chat. Okay, I'm seeing some great answers start to roll in here. Um, so we have take action to correct the injustice, similarly work to get the injustice corrected. Um, when right, keep it right. When wrong, set it to right. Um, we have a, from MLK Jr. Um, it's our duty to disobey unjust laws, um, to speak up when injustice happens, to seek due process, um, to stand up for justice and take action. These are all fantastic answers. Um, and I think you're gonna see a lot of your answers reflected in the actions of these women in the suffrage movement and who are hosting events at Faneuil Hall, um, particularly in 1873. So let's, let's just start talking about why women wanted the right to vote. Um, we'll talk a little bit about their methods and their motivations here. So. We look at this picture <clears throat> and we notice that this is an image of Faneuil Hall in the late 1800s. Um, we notice too though that this is a political space that is not just empty of people but it's completely devoid of any women. Um, it's a little hard to see um, from so far away but there aren't any women at this point in the Great Hall of Faneuil Hall represented for their political actions or for their activism and achievements. There are only men and primarily white men represented in the Great Hall of Manuel Hall at this point. So we see this really important political space that's central to a lot of political actions taken in Boston for centuries, yet we don't see any representation of women in that political space. And unfortunately, this is a really accurate reflection of what it means to be a woman in the United States in the 19th century. Women really do not have a full political voice at this time. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not participating in politics because they certainly are. Um, women are working as lecturers, they're signing petitions, but they can't vote. They don't have that ultimate measure of participation that a lot of men have at this point. Um, in addition to this, when women get married, they actually lose a lot of the really limited political rights that they have. Um, so a woman who's married actually can't claim property, even if she brings that property to the marriage. She also can't claim any money that she earns that is going to be held in her husband's name. Women who are married cannot sign contracts. Um, they cannot be independent in business or in legal transactions. They don't have the right to vote. They certainly don't have the right to hold office. They also can't serve on juries. And remember, one of our rights is the right to a trial by a jury of our peers. So women really, they're missing kind of two rights there. Not only do they not get the civil action of serving on a jury, but they don't get to be tried by a jury trial of their peers. Um, and the other thing, which I think we're gonna find really surprising is that <clears throat> in a divorce, mothers typically lost custody of their children. They didn't have any right to those children. So we see that in the 19th century, not just in Boston, but in the US as a whole, women really don't have much of a voice. 
Um, so then the question has to be asked, how are women, if they don't have a really strong political voice, how are they gonna advocate for the right to vote? Um, and actually women come up with a couple of creative methods to do this. One of the first is petition drives. So as early as the 1840s and the 1850s, um, women like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton begin holding major petition drives to try and present, prevent gendered language from entering the 14th Amendment. Um, prior to the 14th Amendment, um, there is no language in the US Constitution that specifically prohibits women from voting. However, the 14th Amendment changes that. The 14th Amendment specifies that it is men who have the right to vote. And that's the first time we see that specified in the Constitution. Um, unfortunately, this kind of ends up being almost an overcorrection because these senators and representatives, they start to realize from the petition drives happening that women are really actively pushing to have themselves given a proper political voice and have the right to vote. Um, so unfortunately, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and many of their allies work at this point through petition drives. It ends up being detrimental because as we know, that 14th amendment is passed stating that you have to be a man in order to vote. Um, however, this doesn't mean that women are going to be discouraged in their use of petition drives um, the suffrage movement actually uses petition drives throughout the entirety of the time. It ends up being a really useful tool that is used continuously throughout the movement. Uh, one of the other things these women do is they hold conventions. Now, the first women's rights convention is held in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. I'm sure a lot of us, if we have any familiar familiarity with the suffrage movement are familiar with Seneca Falls. Um, and just like petition drives, conventions are something that is also going to be held throughout the entirety of the suffrage movement. Um, these become really great kind of think tanks. These are places where women can come together, where they can meet in person with their allies, um, with other people who are invested in the women's suffrage movement. And they're going to come and discuss how they can continue organizing, advocating for the right to vote, and to regain some more political rights. Um, and then the other thing that women do is they start lecturing. Um, they are going to travel around the country and lecture on behalf of women's rights. One of the first women to do this is a woman named Lucy Stone. Um, and we're going to really dive into Lucy Stone in a little bit. But Lucy Stone actually works for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And she organizes a deal with this organization where she's going to lecture for the abolition of slavery on the weekends. And during the week, she's going to lecture for women's rights. Um, so she sets up a pretty grueling schedule for herself. She's a single unmarried woman. She's traveling by herself around the country, and she is not always well received by audiences. Um, we know that at one point she has a book thrown at her, um, that she is kind of hosed down with cold water at another point. So she's up against a lot of obstacles, but she believes very strongly <clears throat> in both of these causes she's advocating for, and she really cannot be deterred. Um, now, women are also occasionally invited to speak before both state and federal governments on behalf of women's rights. Uh, and again, I want to turn to kind of Elizabeth Cady Stanton as an example of this. On January 23rd, 1867, um, this is before the 14th Amendment is passed, she's actually invited to speak before the New York state government. And Stanton is going to say either men and women were the same citizens under the law, and therefore were entitled to the same right to the fr franchise, or they were so profoundly different that men could not adequately represent women in their interests, and women should therefore represent themselves. Now, this is actually a very powerful statement because one of the arguments coming from anti-suffragists at this point is that women don't need to be represented by themselves. They're already represented by their husbands, by their fathers, by their brothers. Um, they don't need their own voice because their voice is actually being heard through the men in their lives. And Stanton is going to really turn that around on its head. And she's pointing out that not only are we entitled to this, but what if we're so different that you can't actually represent us? She's really not giving them any space to refuse her logic. Now, women also, in addition to all of these tactics, some of them are going to refuse to pay their taxes. 
Uh, and this is going to bring us back to Lucy Stone. In 1858, she actually has all of her worldly possessions seized and sold off to pay her taxes. Um, this is her act of civil disobedience. This is She's doing this in protest because she's kind of sitting here saying, well, why should I be paying my taxes if I don't have a right to vote and I don't have a voice in that government? What am I paying taxes for? So Lucy Stone very steadfastly refuses to pay her taxes and her goods are seized and sold in order to pay that balance. Now there is kind of a happy ending to this story. Um, she has many allies in her hometown and they actually arrange to buy her goods back at auction um, for very low prices. No one really outbid each other. Um, so Lucy Stone is able with the help of her friends to reclaim most of her possessions. Now let's talk a little bit about Lucy. Uh, she is the first Massachusetts woman to earn a bachelor's degree. She actually graduates from Oberlin College in 1847. And as we said before, she goes on to pursue a career as a lecturer for abolition and women's rights. So she's hired by the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And when she's asked why she's lecturing both for the abolition of slavery and for women's suffrage, she has a very succinct answer. Lucy says, I was a woman before I was an abolitionist. And I think that really well encapsulates her outlook on these two movements. For Lucy, she sees a lot of overlap in these and she sees a lot of mutual progress that can be made. She sees that both movement can benefit from the involvement of the other. So we know that she continues this really grueling travel schedule, lecturing on the weekends for anti-slavery and during the week for women's rights. In 1855, after a lot of persuasion, she marries a man named Henry Blackwell. And what's interesting about their marriage is they actually read a marriage protest at the ceremony. So you'll remember, we talked a little bit about earlier how women have very few political rights, but particularly when they marry, they lose any of those remaining rights that they have. So Lucy and her husband, Henry, they sit down before they get married and they really look at the logistics of what rights Lucy would be forfeiting. And they read a protest stating that they reject all of those rights that are supposed to be subsumed under a husband. Um, the other thing that Lucy does is she doesn't take her husband's last name. You notice we're still calling her Lucy Stone. Um, Lucy strongly believes that taking the name of a husband is just another way in which a woman is kind of slowly seeding her identity and being subsumed under her husband. So when she marries, initially she takes her husband's name because she doesn't know that there's another option. Um, and then kind of within the first two years of her marriage, she, she really doesn't feel that this is right. And she actually consults with several lawyers, at which point she's able to verify that she can legally keep her name. There is no legal boundary to it. So she goes back to being, coming, to being Lucy Stone. Um, and she's the first woman we know of to do this. She sets a really incredible example. And to this day, women who opt not to take their husband's name in marriage are referred to Lucy Stoners. So we see this really kind of interesting contemporary connection to Lucy Stone in our current society. Um, now, one of the things that Lucy is most well known for and that I think really defines her career as a suffragist is that she supports the ratification of the 15th Amendment. And that's the amendment that's going to give Black men the right to vote. Um, this really sets her apart from other suffragists. Um, others such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, they actually do not support that 15th Amendment. And unfortunately, this becomes a divisive moment in the women's suffrage movement. Um, now, some suffragists like Stanton and Anthony, they, they really believe, you know, we women have been advocating for decades at this point for our right to vote. How could we possibly support a man, although a black man, getting the right to vote before us? We just, you know, that's too much. We've been fighting for this for years. And others like Lucy Stone and some of the women and men on kind of her camp, they look at it and they say, well, this is progress and progress for anyone. It's progress for everyone. It's progress for our movement. Um, and that's really why Lucy Stone and her kind of allies support that 15th amendment. And that really sets her apart from other suffragists at this time and kind of defines her as both an abolitionist and a suffragist. 
In 1869, um, Lucy Stone is also going to found the American Women's Suffrage Association, which goes on to become one of kind of the premier suffrage associations in the country. And in 1870, she begins publishing the Women's Journal with her husband, Henry. And that's the image you see here on the right. Um, this is the first issue of the Women's Journal that was ever published in January of 1870. Now this becomes the longest running suffrage publication, which is pretty incredible. Um, Lucy Stone and her husband actually published this from 1870 to 1931. And after Lucy passes away, this is carried on um, by her daughter and others kind of in her suffrage circle. Now the Women's Journal becomes this really important vessel for communicating suffrage news. Um, we have to remember that newspapers and magazines and letters are the primary way to communicate with others at this time. So this is a nationally published publication, which means that this is being published every single week and distributed throughout the United States. And this is really helping to keep the women's suffrage movement informed and apprised of what's going on in different states and different cities um, so that they can continue kind of staying up to date and working together towards that singular goal of achieving votes for women. Now, one of the most important things that Lucy Stone does, and this is where we see this really strong connection to Boston and Faneuil Hall, is that she organizes the Women's Tea Party. So this is organized by Lucy Stone and the New England Women's Suffrage Association. She is one of the key organizers. And if you look at this letter on the right, this is from December 5th, 1873. And this is addressed to William Lloyd Garrison. Um, some of us might recognize William Lloyd Garrison from the abolitionist movement. Um, Garrison later becomes a really staunch advocate for women's suffrage and a great ally of that movement. So in this letter, Lucy is actually requesting that Mr. Garrison attend um, her women's tea party in Faneuil Hall. And you can see here this final line here, P.S. Let us know, please, so that we can make the announcement. Um, so Lucy Stone, she's really, she's asking for an answer in the hopes that uh, Mr. Garrison is going to attend and kind of let, lend his voice to this, that's where my mouse goes, there we go, lend his voice to this organization and this event they're putting on for women's suffrage. She recognizes the power of him as an ally. And you can see over here on the left-hand side, this is an advertisement for the Women's Tea Party. Um, you can see that she's chosen to really highlight some of these important names of both the abolitionists and the suffrage movements um, in the hope that it's going to get people in the door and to the Women's Tea Party. So it's really important to remember, this is a diverse group of men and women. Um, we have people like Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson, Julia Ward Howe, Wendell Phillips, Mary Livermore, of course, William Lloyd Garrison, as we see in this letter here. Um, Lucy Stone is one of the keynote speakers. Frederick Douglass, who we know um, is an incredible abolitionist, and Stephen Foster. Um, and these are, all these are all people who are going to come to the Great Hall of Faneuil Hall on December 15th, 1873, to support whoops, the Women's Tea Party. So this is another image of the inside of Faneuil Hall from the 1870s. Um, this is roughly what we think it would have looked like at the time that Lucy Stone and her allies hosted that women's tea party. The image on the right hand side of your screen is an image of the ticket. Now these were the, this is an, the actual ticket that was printed and distributed to Bostonians, to visitors of the city who were intending to attend this event. So you would have had to show this ticket at the door um, and it would have kind of gotten you in the door to hear Lucy Stone and all of these incredible suffragists speaking about the need to continue the fight for the abolition, for the, um, for women's suffrage. So what's really significant about the date, 1873, is exactly 100 years, almost to the day, because this event is held on December 15th, to the anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. Um, now we know that the initial meetings for the Boston Tea Party actually started in Faneuil, ha Faneuil Hall. Um, however, at that point, Faneuil Hall was about half of the size that we see today. So it actually was not the largest meeting space in Boston. 
And because the Boston Tea Party was such a peak event in the lead up to the revolution. They actually have too many people to fit in Faneuil Hall. So they shift over to Old South Meeting House, which at that point was a little larger. So Lucy Stone is being really deliberate. She's choosing to hold the Women's Tea Party, which is of course a play on the Boston Tea Party in the exact same space where those Boston Tea Party meetings initially occurred. Um, so between the hours of 4 p.m. and 9 p.m., we know that between 3,000 and 5,000 people attended this event. Um, now, you can probably judge from the space that this is not a huge space. There certainly wouldn't have been chairs during this event. So use your imagination to really consider how packed in people would have been. This is standing room only. This is a really big event. It's well attended and the people coming are really passionate. They're really coming to learn more about suffrage, to lend their support to the, to the movement and they're excited to be here. Um, the suffragists are also going to choose some key decorations for the Great Hall. Um, so this, you know, this is a space where the Boston Tea Party started. So they're going to hang a banner that's again, a play on a lot of those arguments from the Tea Party. And their banner is going to read, taxation without representation is tyranny. Um, and then that is gonna be hanging right over the center of the stage. And on the right gallery, they have a second banner which reads, governments derive their just power from the consent of the governed. Um, and then on that little stage that you saw in an earlier photo, you're going to have the leaders and the keynote speakers seated on the stage. Now there are, are a couple different arguments that are going to be made during the course of this Tea Party. Um, the first is that all women should be enfranchised. Um, and to illustrate kind of what these arguments sounded like, I'm gonna share a couple of quotes with you. And the first is from Frederick Douglass. At this event, Frederick Douglass is going to say, it was just this, every man himself, that is all. Some of us say that every woman is herself and as nobody can be represented by anybody else, that therefore she should have a voice in the government. I am for women's voting. I am for women's education. I am for women's rights to do anything and everything in this world that she is capable of doing and doing well. So imagine standing in the Great Hall with three to 5,000 people, hearing Frederick Douglass speak, seeing this tremendous leader of the abolitionist movement, a man who had begun his life in slavery, who had escaped, who had dedicated his life to fighting for the freedom of all Black men and women. And now he's lending his voice to the suffrage movement. And he is standing up there and unequivocally saying that he is in favor of women's suffrage. Imagine how strongly that endorsement would have rang out in Faneuil Hall. So folks who are speaking at this event, um, they're also going to advocate for some of the same things that the founding fathers advocated for in 1773 in the lead up to the American Revolution and of course that Boston Tea Party. Um, they're going to really deliberately draw parallels between the Tea Party and the 1873 Women's Tea Party. Um, after all, it's held in the same location, so what better way than to kind of ground their movement in that historic space. Um, Mary A. Livermore, she's going to get up and say, to speak here in Faneuil Hall, surrounded by the pictures of men such as Fa Samuel Adams, brings very forcibly to my mind that taxation with re without representation is indeed tyranny. The men of 1773 could not endure it, and I think that the women of 1873 ought not to submit. The women's work will never cease until there is an utter ignoring of all distinctions of sex as a basis of legislation. So these are really powerful words, right? She's linking the women's movement of 1873 to that iconic movement of the founding fathers in the 1770s and 1780s. Um, I really don't think that there is a stronger tie that can be made. Now, the other thing is they're gonna have a couple calls to action during the course of this meeting. And one of them is going to come from Lucy Stone herself. She is actually going to call for women to boycott the centennial celebrations of the United States if women are not enfranchised by 1876, if they do not yet have the right to vote. So Lucy Stone is going to get up and say, sisters, who of you will join in a pledge that when the 4th of July, 1876 comes, we will take no part in its centennial celebration if at that time, we are as now held politically below the pardoned rebels, below the enfranchised slaves, and on the same level with idiots, lunatics, and felons. 
So Lucy Stone, she's using some powerful language here, but more importantly, she's got this call to action. We're in 1873 when she says this, and she's planning for three years down the road. And she's choosing this iconic event, this centennial celebration of the new country. And she's asking her fellow suffragists, she's addressing them as sisters. Um, she's asking her allies to join with her and to forgo any celebrations. Um, and we can surmise that she's not just going to forgo these quietly. You know, this is the woman who refused to pay her taxes and had all of her worldly possessions auctioned off. Um, we know that Lucy Stone here is, is planning to really um, make some noise about the fact that women don't have the right to vote um, and kind of come into contention with those centennial celebrations. But this is all being kind of proposed in Faneuil Hall in the Cradle of Liberty in that same space where the founding fathers came together to decide if they should be advocating for a new country independent of Great Britain. So then we have to ask the question, does it work? Um, and unfortunately the answer is not immediately. Women don't walk out of the Women's Tea Party in 1873 with the right to vote. Um, the 19th Amendment is going to be ratified in 1920 and it gives all women the right to vote at that point. So this is great. However, a lot of the women who attended the 1873 Women's Tea Party in Faneuil Hall were not alive when that 19th Amendment was ratified. Um, Lucy Stone was going to pass away in 1893. Um, her dying words to her daughter, Alice, are make the world better. Um, so Alice is, of course, going to follow in her mother's footsteps, and she will be one of the first women to vote in 1920 after the ratification of that amendment. But I would argue that this was a really successful event. It's going to bring national attention to the women's suffrage movement. Um, this Women's Tea Party from December 1873, it's reported in Boston newspapers, but it's also reported in national newspapers. Um, these women and their allies, they are presenting arguments that resonate with most of those who attend, but they also pass a resolution here to oppose a bill that is being proposed in Utah which would disenfranchise women there. So women at this point had some really um, kind of rudimentary rights in Utah. And there was a bill on the table in the Senate that would have stripped women of these kind of beginning rights. Um, so this group kind of drafts the resolution and then they have a vote to see if they're going to accept this resolution. Um, it, it is almost unanimous. If you look back at the historical records of this event, um, it is noted multiple times that there were two people who opposed this resolution and they were both described as very young men. So you can kind of read the subtext there that um, they're young, they're men, they might really not have their, their heads in the right place yet when it comes to the women's suffrage movement. So we see this group almost unanimously taking direct action. Um, they're, they're leaving here knowing that they are going to continue to agitate for that, that proposed bill in Utah to be repealed. Um, the goal of this Tea Party is not to achieve suffrage on that day, that they, they know that that's not within their reach on December 15, 1873. The goal is to continue working towards suffrage. Um, so William Lloyd Garrison um, at the meeting, he, he kind of gives his impression of was this meeting successful? And he says, so I am here as a women's rights man for the freedom of the sex as for the freedom of the slave. This is indicating the growth of this cause and should inspire us all. And I don't think you could really say it better than Garrison does there. There are three to 5,000 people packed into Faneuil Hall. Um, Boston in 1873 is significantly smaller than it is today. That is a large group of the population. And a lot of these people are really dedicated to this cause. Um, you know, it's not just anyone who's going to come and stand for five hours in a crowd of 5,000 people to hear these leaders of the abolitionist and suffragist movement speak for women's suffrage. Um, so I want to pause here again and pose that question to you again. What is the duty of a citizen when facing injustice? I want us to take a minute to kind of think through what we've just learned about Lucy Stone, the suffragists, the Women's Tea Party here in Boston. And I want everyone to think again on this question and to share some of your answers in the chat. So we'll just take one minute.
All right. So starting to see some answers. We have someone saying that showing up is a great first step. Absolutely. A lot of the people who attended the women's tea party knew that that was a step that was within their reach and that could be helpful. Um, I see have good arguments and a lot of friends. Absolutely. Rally support, find like-minded people and come together to make changes. Shout out the injustice. Absolutely. These are all things that the women's suffrage movement is doing. They are looking to their allies to support them and to elevate their cause. Um, so when we think about 1873, the women's suffrage movement and what the duty of a citizen when facing injustice is, it's to organize, to advocate, to campaign for the right to vote, to fundraise, to help support those goals, um, and in some cases to boycott the upcoming centennial celebration of the U.S. Um, the women's suffrage movement is not going to give up until they get women the right to vote, and they really do perceive the great injustice of their generation as not having the right to vote. Um, these are women and men who cannot sit back and accept that. They are determined to advocate and to organize for change and to improve this country, not just for themselves, but for future generations. So this is a picture of the Great Hall today. And it's really, it is tricky to see in this picture, but if you notice where my cursor is, there's a bust there. And that's actually a bust of Lucy Stone. She was added about 20 years ago. Um, and she, to this day, remains the only woman who was represented in the Great Hall for her achievements. Um, I think it's incredible that Lucy Stone is represented in the Great Hall. It gives us a fantastic opening to talk about women's suffrage with our visitors. Um, but it also kind of begs the question, who else should be represented here in this Great Hall? And it's not just women, but all sorts of American citizens and activists over the last couple of centuries really do deserve to be in this space. And Lucy Stone kind of serves as the tip of that iceberg and as a reminder that not everyone who's been part of these historic national movements is represented in this hall. And we're so thankful that we have Lucy there because she really gives us the opening to talk much more broadly about suffrage in Boston and on a national level. I also want to point out that suffrage is a continuum, and that's something that Lucy Stone knew, um, that she recognized, and that she tried to use to her advantage. The fight for suffrage isn't going to end on that day in 1873 or in 1920. We know that it's continuously evolving, um, and that voting rights, even today and throughout the 20th century, continue to evolve. Um, the National Parks of Boston is committed to sharing the full history of Faneuil Hall, and to us, that means continuing to share the stories of Lucy Stone or the founding fathers of leading abolitionists, of all of those people who came together in the Great Hall to advocate not just for voting rights or the end of slavery or a new country, but to advocate for their causes for more justice in their country. Um, so one of the ways that we try to support this is we have a town meeting about the Women's Tea Party. And this is Kind of what you see represented in the image here, one of my colleagues in historic colonial uh, 19th century dress. Um, so we offer visitors character cards, which include real quotes from those meetings in 1873. Um, we have our staff clothed in uh, period clothing, and then we kind of reenact that meeting using historically supported arguments. So you can be a visitor sitting there um, reading the words of Lucy Stone or Mary Livermore or William Lloyd Garrison or Frederick Douglass. Um, and it gives us this really great way to bring everyone into that moment, that historical moment. Um, and it's a kind of different way of embracing the history. Now, unfortunately, because of COVID, um, we haven't had the chance to run this one in person, but we have hosted a lot of these meetings virtually um, with student groups, with Girl Scouts, um, with people who are just kind of interested in learning a little bit more about women's suffrage in Boston. So we are regularly <laughs> engaging our visitors to Faneuil Hall and to our park in the story of Lucy Stone and other women suffragists in Boston. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Katie, who I think is going to be moderating our question and answer session. Thanks, Amelia. And a uh, great presentation, uh, very productive provocative and, and relevant essential question that you have there. Um, we do have some questions in the chat and I will just make a call. If anyone else has questions for Amelia, please feel free to enter them into the chat. 
Um, our first question has to do with uh, representation and the definition of representation for suffragists. Um, so is, do you think the suffragists and the attendees of the 1873 Women's Tea Party uh, were calling for an expansion of the founders' ideas of representation or for replacing it with a new, a totally new definition uh, when they rejected the idea that women and others could be represented by white men? That's a tough question. Um, I, you know, I would start by saying that at this point, I have not read anything that directly answers that question. So um, whatever I share is going to just kind of be me extrapolating on what I know. Um, I think that all change, even in a place like Boston, that has one of the it's a city that's really on the forefront of women's suffrage and the abolition of slavery, even in a place like Boston, change is slow. So I, I would guess that at this point, it's not so much a total rewriting of what representation is and more it's a drastic expansion. Um, we might look back at it through our lens in 2021 and think, man, that looks like a really narrow amount of representation, but these are truly radical ideas. Giving women the right to vote is a really radical earth shattering idea in 1873. Um, so based on what I have read and the research I've done, um, I would say not a complete overthrow of what their representation is and more a drastic expansion. Excellent. Uh, you also, when you're talking about those who attended the Women's Tea Party, you, you mentioned how you know men were standing side by side on the platform with women during the Tea Party. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the roles of male allies um, you know, in this particular moment, but maybe if you could expand throughout the suffrage movement? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the suffrage movement is really interesting and it, it's very similar to the abolitionist movement in a lot of different ways. Um, in the abolitionist movement, you see women doing a lot of kind of the supporting work um, where you see men more on the forefront. So when you look at who the lecturers are for the abolitionist movement, you see a lot of men. But when you start to kind of trace where the money is coming from, you notice that a lot of it is being funneled to these organizations from female dominated and female led organizations. And they're the ones who are out there kind of doing the lecturing, sorry, not the lecturing, the petition drives, the fundraisers, and they're elevating that to these male dominated organizations and lecturers so that they can kind of amplify their voice. Now, when we look at the suffrage movement, we see almost the opposite of that. You see women doing the same things that they're doing in the abolitionist movement. They're having petition drives, they're going door to door, they're fundraising. But now we see women more on the forefront of these events and we see men being invited into these events um, as well as kind of headlining some of them. So Frederick Douglass in 1873, it's hard to kind of get any more popular or bigger than him, right? He would have been a major draw for this event. Um, but these men, their role really is to be the best allies they can be for these women. The role of the men at this point is not just to share their opinion into lecture, but to really be creating this kind of equality between themselves and the women that they are lecturing and advocating with and elevating those women and kind of putting them at the center of this movement. That's, that's great. And it, it makes me think of uh, Shirley Chisholm's, you know, Bring, kind of expanding the table so then everyone can have a part in it. Um, we do have another question and I'll just throw out if anyone else has additional questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat. Um, we do have one that's kind of broader beyond uh, the Tea Party itself. And it goes back to when you were talking about Lucy Stone and how she split, uh, split from Anthony and Stanton over the 19th or over the 15th Amendment. And how did that split kind of affect Lucy Stone's work in the movement and the movement as a whole? Yeah, this is complicated. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna do my best to kind of wrap it up neatly. Um, again, we're looking back right through the 2021 lens. So we look back now and we're like, oh, an amendment that's gonna give black men the right to vote. Of course we should ratify that. That's fantastic. That's the direction we need to go in. But in the 1860s and 1870s, that is just not where a lot of the suffragists were at. Um, a lot of these women are kind of looking at this and saying, this has been my life's work. I've devoted my entire life, maybe first to helping to end enslavement, and then I've become a suffragist, or I've been a suffragist the whole time. 
And I just want to give women the right to vote. So this is a tough pill for a lot of women to swallow. swallow. And they're human, you know, they're prone to disappointment and to feeling marginalized. So for a lot of women, this, this is kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back. And Lucy Stone is kind of the exception to the rule here. A lot of women, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, they look at this and they're like, I cannot support this. I've put way too much work into getting women the right to vote. I cannot, I just can't stand to see some other male getting the right to vote before me. Um, and, and at that point, they take, unfortunately, um, a more kind of prejudiced track and they come out openly against the 15th Amendment. Now, Lucy Stone, she has this perspective that's incredible. And she looks at it and she says, progress for anyone is progress for everyone. And there are a lot of suffragists who are able to do that too. And unfortunately, this really splits the women's suffrage movement. We have two factions. We have one that's kind of headed by Stanton and Anthony who are opposing the 15th Amendment. We have one that's headed by Lucy Stone and her allies that supports the amendment. And even after that 15th Amendment is ratified, we really don't see those factions coming together. It, it continues to be divisive within the women's suffrage movement. Um, when Lucy, when Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton reach a point in the late 19th century where they decide they need to write kind of this anthology of the suffrage movement, they wanna make sure they're recording all of their work, um, they think it's time and they reach out to Lucy and they say, do you wanna write part of this, you know, to include your work in here? And Lucy refuses and she says, no, it's not done. We're not ready to write this. I don't think it would be right. So she refuses and unfortunately, because she refuses, Stanton and Anthony don't write her part. So she kind of gets written out of history and her side of the story, along with her many allies, isn't in that history of women's suffrage, which is unfortunately what a lot of historians use to inform a lot of our current understanding of the women's suffrage movement. So really, even in 2021, we tend to have kind of a skewed perspective of how the women's suffrage movement progressed after that 15th Amendment. It's really not until that next generation of suffragists comes of age, and we're, we're talking about women like Lucy's daughter, Alice, and that generation that's going to see the, the 19th Amendment ratified in 1920. It's not until that generation comes in that they're able to really unify that movement and bring it back together for kind of that final charge towards suffrage. Yeah, I, find, I find that uh, kind of backstory fascinating because it can it shows that even within movements, you know, there's varied perspectives on how, you know, how you can get the job done, so to speak, and, and the path to getting there. Uh, we do have a question. We did have a question about Lucy Stone's religion, but since it seems like that was pretty well covered in the chat, I think we'll we'll move on to the next one. Um, and this might be a question that you might need to extrapolate on based on your your knowledge. Um, of the event, but did the Tea Party cause attendees to, to get involved in the suffrage movement? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, that's, that's another tough one. It's really hard to kind of measure engagement with the suffrage movement um, if someone isn't out there advocating and lecturing. Um, I think there's a couple things here. The first is that, depending on the sources you look at, there's three to 5,000 people in that meeting. Um, a lot of people, you know, knowing human nature probably went home and they sat down with their family, with their friends, and they probably talked a little bit about what their experience was. Um, and we really, we can't underestimate something like that, right? So much of the movement forward, not just in the suffrage movement, but in a lot of social movements at this point is those conversations being had outside of events, um, this kind of broadening of people's perspectives. Um, I think we likely saw a lot of people walk out of that meeting with broader perspectives that night. I don't know if the two young men who voted against the resolution necessarily had a broader perspective, but I think a lot of people walked out more well-informed about the suffrage movement. I think certain people probably work, walked out very inspired to continue working or to begin working for suffrage. Um, I absolutely believe that this was a really important event in Boston and on a national scale for the suffrage movement. Um, this is something, again, that receives national attention. So if you don't live in Boston, you might be hearing about the suffrage movement anywhere else in the U.S., um, and that can be really inspiring as well. So 
extrapolating from what I know, I would say some people walked out inspired and became suffragists who were out advocating. Some probably went home and talked about it with friends and family and kind of opened their mind a little more and then really everything in between. That's great. So I think we'll end on this last question, uh, just because I feel it, it really brings it to today. Um, and it asks, what lessons do you think that we can take today from Lucy Stone and the suffragists when facing social political issues uh, with strong organized opposition? Wow. <laughs> Tricky question <laughs> when you're in uniform. <laughs> um, I, so I really enjoy studying Lucy Stone because I think she does have some really good contemporary lessons we can take from her. Um, Lucy's so diligent in her work. She decides what her beliefs are, what her morals are, and she sticks to them for her entire life. Um, remember, this is a woman whose dying words are make the world better. She is so selfless um, and she truly is dedicated to doing what she can to improve the lives of the people around her and herself. Um, so I would say we can really, we can learn from that diligence. Um, she's very dogged. She never gives up. There are so many instances in which it would have been totally understandable for her to take a step back and say, Hey, it's just not worth it. I'm getting books thrown at me and I'm getting sprayed by hoses during my lectures. This isn't for me anymore, but she is so determined. Um, so I think that determination um, the patience to, to really take a step back when you see things shifting within a social movement and really thoughtfully evaluate if this is a problem for you, if this is progress for someone and therefore also for you. Um, but that ability to kind of remove yourself, take a step back and really approach it with a very selfless, equitable mindset. Um, there's, I mean, there's so many lessons that we can learn from Lucy Stone. Those are really just a couple, but her perspective, her, her diligence and her determination really are exemplary. Thank you, Amelia. Um, wise words for us to end with. And, and thank you for such a uh, wonderful program. Uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Karen. <clears throat> Hello, you can hear me first because I unmuted first. This was absolutely amazing. I was just like here, just like riveted, just watching. <laughs> um, and I can't wait to actually, I remember hearing about Lucy Stone our last season and I know I definitely want to read more about her. About her. I, I really love the quote you also used. I know this is not about Karen reflection time, but we're going with it anyway. I really love progress for one is progress for all. I really enjoyed that. Um, anyway, once again, not about me. Um, thank you so much again, Amelia. That was amazing. And for everyone, if you want to come back in the next couple of weeks, in two more weeks, I believe it is March 15th, will be quarantine. What is the title of that one? That is Quarantine on Boston Harbor, the Islands and Public Life, which will be very interesting. And the one at the end of the month is Pirate or Patriot, um, which is gonna be awesome as well. And if you can click on, just in case it doesn't pop up because you know, technology doesn't work when you really want it to, um, you can click on the survey link in the chat and you can tell us what a great job Amelia did because she did. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We'll see you guys soon.